liberties and our rule of law, and we will close Guantanamo and restore habeas corpus. And if you elect me, you will have a president who has taught the Constitution and believes in the Constitution and will obey the Constitution of the United States of America. I know that one of the arguments that's been made is, is that, uh, you know, there, there, there's some arguments that have been made lately in this campaign season. Uh, one of them is, you know, Obama's been a, may make a good speech. He makes a good speech, but he hasn't been in Washington long enough. We need to season and stew them a little bit more and boil all the hope out of them. The American people have not bought this argument, you notice. Uh, it's been made for the last nine months. But the American people understand that the last thing we need is to have the same old cast of characters doing the same old things over and over again and somehow expecting a different result. We don't need somebody who can play the game better. We need somebody who can put an end to the game playing. That's why I'm running for President of the United States of America. Uh, we've heard another argument that well, Obama hasn't gone up against the Republicans. They'll tear him up. And I've got to explain, I'm from the south side of Chicago. I'm skinny, but I'm tough. And I am looking forward to a debate with John McCain. Now, John McCain's a good man. He's an American hero, and we honor his service to this nation. But he has made some bad choices about the company he keeps. You know, he has embraced every failed policy of George Bush's. He speaks of a hundred-year war in Iraq and sees another on the horizon with Iran. And let me tell you, if he wants a hundred-year war in Iraq, that's a good reason not to give him four years in the White House. I'm happy to have that debate with John McCain. He wants to make permanent the George Bush tax cuts that he once courageously opposed. No, but that's what happens when you spend too long in Washington. You know, the wheels on the Straight Talk Express kind of spin off. And so I'm happy to have that debate about the failed economic policies of the past because I intend to lead the party of tomorrow, not the party of yesterday. That's why I'm running for President of the United States of America. So I am happy to have a debate with the Republicans. But then we've had, heard another argument that, well, you know, uh, one candidate talks pretty, makes nice speeches, is in inspirational, but the other person's in the solutions business. Uh, and the notion is, I guess, words don't matter or are just a bunch of fluff. It's style over substance. And, you know, this argument obviously ignores the 20 years that I've spent devoted to public service at every level. Uh, it's hard to understand if you talk to people who know that, that I, they have a job because of the job training I put in place or the health care that they obtained or those who aren't sitting on death row because of the criminal justice system that we reformed or those who understand that we've dealt with issues of nuclear proliferation at the international level in ways that haven't been done before. But understand this argument about words not mattering. I, the most important thing that we can do right now is to re-engage the American people in the process of governance, to get them excited and interested again in what works and what can work in our government, to make politics cool again and important again and relevant again. Don't tell me words don't matter. 
I have a dream, just words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, just words. We have nothing to fear but fear itself, just words, just speeches. It's true that speeches don't solve all problems. But what is also true is if we cannot inspire the country to believe again, then it doesn't matter how many policies and plans we have. And that is why I'm running for President of the United States of America. And that's why we just won eight elections straight, because the American people want to believe in change again. Don't tell me words don't matter. inspiration don't matter. Don't tell me hope doesn't matter. It's fascinating to me to see lately my campaign criticized because I talk about hope too much. Oh, he, he, he's talking about hope again. He's so naive. He's so idealistic. His head's in the clouds. He's a hope monger. He needs a reality check. He's peddling false hopes. False hopes. False hopes. The notion is, apparently, that if you talk about hope, you must not have a clear view of reality. That you must just be, you know, going around happy as can be, <laughs> ignorant of those mean Republicans out there. All the barriers that stand in your way. Listen, it's, it's true I talk about hope a lot. I talk about hope because it's very unlikely that I'm standing on this stage here tonight. I was born to a teenage mom. My father left when I was two. I was raised by a single mother and my grandparents. They didn't have money and they didn't have wealth. They had no status. They gave me love, they gave me an education, and they gave me hope. And so I do talk about hope. We put hope on our signs. I delivered a speech in Boston about hope. I wrote a book called The Audacity of Hope. But this notion that somehow hopes are false, that implies that hope is blind optimism, that you're passive, that you're waiting and sitting back for good things to happen, that you're shirking from a fight. That's not what hope is. Hope is not blind optimism. Hope is not ignoring the challenges that stand in your way. I know how hard it will be to bring about change in this country. I know how hard it's going to be to deliver on universal health care. If it was easy, it would have already been done. I know how difficult it will be to bring about a sensible energy policy in this country. ExxonMobil made $11 billion this past quarter. They don't want to give up their profits easily. I know how hard it will be to alleviate poverty in places like inner city Milwaukee or the south side of Chicago. That poverty is built up over generations, over centuries. Same thing in the reservations. There's a long history there that we've never fully accounted for. I know how hard it will be to fix our schools because it's not just a function of money. It is a function of changing attitudes. We're going to have to change how we teach our children. We're going to have to change how we nurture them. We're going to have to parent. And changing culture is a hard thing. I know because I have fought on the streets as an organizer. I have fought in the courts as a civil rights attorney. I have fought in the legislature, and I've won some good fights. But I've also lost some fights because I know good intentions are not enough when not fortified with political will and political power. I I've seen how politics can be used to make us afraid of each other and how we turn on each other, how fear can cloud our judgment. And suddenly we start scapegoating gay people or immigrants or people who don't look like us or Muslims because